Greetings everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here in the New Order Last Days of Europe, in which we are playing as the Free State of Magadan. If you'd like to read about the country info, go right ahead. And there's the next paragraph. And the following paragraph, 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 paragraph. Cool. So, Magadan, which is one of the countries that got a little bit more content in the Cutting Room Floor update. Now I'm running on Cutting Room Floor update or patch with patch D, just to be specific. But we'll talk about the mod we're using very soon, but the true Ev Abin. The Russian fascist party, as it was known in Harbin, is now gone. Long displeased with Radzevsky's policies and rhetoric, Batovsky and his wing of the party had taken control of Magadan and are now molding it to suit their purposes. No longer shall the party struggle in the mud, while the whole of Russia suffers. No more thuggery, no more rhetorics of hatred. Mother Russia calls upon us to her fold, to rescue her from ruin. Before Makovsky can do his duty for his motherland, however, he must rule alone, without constraint and dis free of disloyalty. While he trusts the wing of the party, he must crush dissent among the ranks. All those suspected of loyalty to Radzevsky shall find themselves perched, with his political hold over Magadan secure. Makovsky shall do a sacred duty, one that he has steeled himself to do ever since the heady days of Harbin. Under his guidance, Russia shall stand again, sold, strong and unrivaled. We get political power, a little bit more war support, and we start with the whole two research slots, which will immediately go ahead and grab civilian construction two, as well as some research speed, because that stuff is always good. What do we start with? I'll be honest, I have not tried this off-screen at all. I have no idea what's going to happen, and actually I do have a good idea what's going to happen since I've played to you know enough times to see from other campaigns what could happen and we start off with one normal infantry division let's see 12 combat width it's okay it's decent it'll work for now and two light infantry which is basically what we expected it to be that should be led by Vrastil mm, Yuri Constantine let's go with this guy because he's pretty good in defense and attack so and he shall have Pavlov Pavlov hmm civilian factories all the way we have Literally a single state here. Okay, then. And then we'll do some of that, because we can. Free military factories. We have a single military. Wow. Oh, that is not going to be good. Motorized. We need some of that. We're going to need some support equipment. We can speed time up just a little bit more. It's January 1st, 62. APCs. Hmm. I'm going to say... Hmm, maybe not. Maybe not. Because with the direction I want us to go... I want to eventually not use tanks, maybe, but use maybe. Actually, we don't need to see this stuff. Oh, we don't have any have cast. That sucks. I guess we'll go tactical bombers. I want to get transport helicopters finally. Uh, if we had to make something, just make. Do we have a navy? Any sort of navy at all? No. Well, that's all right. Make a ship. It can be. Oh, you know what? We're not gonna make garbage stuff. So, are they the same class? K class? It's fine. Whatever. Make a whole Uno. And then some convoys. Just kind of like what I do in Oral Blues. There we go. Let's let time go on. Alright, so we're led by Matkovsky Mikhail here. This division recovery rate and the last of the true. Matkovsky steadied his glasses against his nose, peering down at a small piece of paper with rows and rows of names written all over it. A list of Rodzevsky's suspected loyalists. He looked up to discover a room packed to the brim with books from his White Army days. Old decaying American newspapers and the far corner shrouded in the dark. An old gramophone gathering rust and dust. The sight of the thing brought back a smirk to Matkovsky's face. The old had been building the dances and the parties and above all of it, the electric swastika promising another future for the Russian stranded there. The doorbell rang, shaking Matkovsky from his reverie. Two gruff men, dressed in the party uniform, entered. In a small and messy room, they stood out as an oddity, almost barbaric even. Their feet thumped loudly on the wooden floors as they attempted clumsily or clumsy salutes. One lean with breezes of blonde hair peeking beneath the party cap, the other stocky with a bulge of his stomach plain to the eye. After a few moments of awkward silence, Matkovsky stared at them before finally saying, Well, with trembling voices, they gave him the name to the people they had perched today. Matkovsky gave him a generous smile. Thank you. You may go. When he heard the door knob latch itself closed, he turned back to his list. Sergei A. Bruno B. Nicholas C. He crossed them out, dabbing the names in thick black ink, snuffing them out forever from the history of the Russian fascist party. Balancing his glass of whiskey in his hand, Matkovsky looked at his reflection against the murky liquid before taking a sip. The hours went by. The doorbell rang and the man came and did their salutes, telling him of the names disappearing from the list. Sometimes when the wind was right, he could hear the crackle of gunfire or rifle fire somewhere deep in the woods. It was nighttime. By the time he finished the list, he gently pushed the men out, thanking them for a job well done. That's where they left. He bolted the door behind them, turning to his gramophone, he decided that he would dance to the memories of Harbin. He turned it on and let the good times roll. The Vaz still has a lot of work to do. And we have some national spirits. The heirs of Harbin, 
a lot. Really good factory output. Stability hurts though, a little bit. Fascist splitters. Alright, we get more attack. I like that. And recovery rate. And critical population factor. Even though we don't have that much population at all. Gateway into Russia is pretty good. We get a whole 0 0.02 or 2. Yeah, 0 0.02 every day. I was going to say 2,000th of a political power, but I don't want to say that. And Port of Magadan. Very nice. Building the Wastes. News of horror drifts from the West. German ter terror bombings, bandit raids, and wars fought by Russians against Russians on the edges of the far eastern Russia. Magadan is remote and sheltered from the troubles that plague the rest of the motherland. Due to its distance, however, Magadan is not much. Located in the sparsest region of Russia, both in population and resources, there's not much here that is of use for the eventual liberation and reunion of Russia. Medkovsky will change that. The officials of his party will, shall travel the streets and outskirts of Magadan, for workers willing to join him in his crusade. They will build roads and telegram poles, small workshops, and manufactories. When the days of liberation dawns upon the dark body of Russia, laid to rest by failures of the Reds and the crimes of the Germans, they shall find themselves richly rewarded by their duty and dedication. For Matkowski shall let no faith in him go to waste. Industrial equipment and society development will begin to improve, and get two whole infrastructure. Not bad. Now we are at Russian Unifier, beginning stages. So we got things we can do here, and we can probably raid against other people. Which one do we want? Do we want this group? Who is led by Gorgi Basharin? No divisions? No divisions. I'm liking this whole no division thing. So this is Yakutia. Saka? Yeah, we want this one. No, no. We want the Saka Republic, yeah. That's going to take just a wee bit of time for guys to get over there, which is fine. The Reich's last conquest, if you like to read about that, go right ahead. Has the space race been won? Perhaps. And hopefully we get another division here soon enough. Oh, well, we don't have enough command power. That's really why we're taking so long with that. Industrial investments as a Russian unifier, very beginning stages. I usually, usually like to choose industrial investments just because we really, 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 really want another factory. The modern Bogatia. Of all the tales of the Russian anarchy, there stands but one that has spread from the frozen lands of the far east to the city of Kostrama in the west, and even deep into the lands of the Nazi Empire. The story of a wanderer from parts unknown who brings justice with them as they walk the desolate roads of old Russia. This wanderer has come to be one of the greatest enigmas of all of Russia. Little is known about this enigma. Some report they are a former ranger of the Ural Guard, a man who left his home to bring justice to the worst of Russia. Others tell of a former Wehrmacht soldier, consumed by guilt and under a self-imposed exile, as a penance to the people he wronged. A few scant reports tell of a widow just from a destroyed village, seeking to bring to others the justice, justice she was denied. Whispers in the East speak of an American volunteer from the West Russian Warp, stuck in a land not his own, but still doing good where he wandered. And in the bars of Siberian cities, one can always find strange and likely drug-induced tales of a man from the future coming back to save the world, whatever their true identity, and whatever the purpose in the corpse of the Soviet Union might be. All that is truly known is the kindness that they have shown to people so used to violence and death. Tales are told of the wanderer holding off entire bandit raiding parties, single-handedly. Liberated slaves from Perm tell of an angel of light, freeing them from the shackles before disappearing into the night. And rumors have come even from Moscow, of a one-man raid on Nazi strongholds. In the end, while many of these deeds are undoubtedly fictitious, the actions of this hero, the modern-day Bogatyr, have lit a fire of hope in the hearts of even the most trampled upon in Russia. An interesting story, if nothing else. Building the West, and we have about 11 days left, and let's see what we can do here. Yeah, I'm just going to wait for this. Actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to get more stability. Yeah, that's that's probably key to what we want right now. Come on. But assassin strikes at Mr. Schmittler. All in today's work. Alexander Pavlov stood in the chilly air, a war, not warm enough coat around him, facing the leader of the RFP security team he just assigned to this mission. Though perhaps security team wasn't the best term to describe them, since they were really more than ill-equipped thugs. They had no qualms about or following orders, though, and the Vaz had little money to spare, so Pavlov supposed they would have to do. Have the preparations been made, he asked the men before him. Yes, sir, the security team leader replied confidently. Our men are positioned all around the warehouse, ready to begin the attack on your command. Pavlov nodded, nodded at that, looking over at the warehouse with a smile that many in his life described as unsettling. He understood why perfectly well. He enjoyed his job to an extent that most wouldn't consider normal, and he never once felt the slightest hesitation about ordering lives to be snuffed out like candles at night. No, he understood. All right, he just didn't care. Anything for fascism, no matter what it involved. Fire at will, take no quarter, have a good time. Nice. All right, so these guys, they gotta go. Come on. Oh, so you guys are right there, and you guys are right there. So they do have one division. They lie to me. They do have a division. But they say no divisions. Well, it looks like a really weak division, and our our soldiers aren't really that great. Double check. Good. Let's try it. Hopefully they say no, or they re they refuse to give in, or they hopefully they refuse to give in actually. Uh, industrial expertise or Siberian farms. A little bit of 
Flag. Let's, we get a civilian factory, so we'll do this one. Civilian factories. Magadan has been noted before as remote and isolated from the rest of Russia. In the port town of Magadan itself, the industry that exists is small and not particularly tailored to the production of war and material. Of war material. Fortunately, in the Far East, this lack of industry persists everywhere, as the industrial center of Vladivostok, developed in the time of the Reds, is now lost to the Japanese and Manchurians. To put it briefly, all those we fight in the East are on their level playing ground. No opportunity passes Matkovsky by, however. From the west of Siberia, he shall craft factories with the express intent of waging war, not small town conflicts between children. The party shall arm and train the soldiers of Magadana soldiers, not bandits of possessing a higher ideal. Additionally, no citizen sheltering under the wings of the party shall know of poverty or lack. Th let this be an example, a vision of Russia to come. Absolutely. Night terrors, the stench of sweat. The fear of degenerates incapable of standing up for themselves, another early morning break in, and another communist spy in, hard in the Harbin community seized from his kin. The Japanese paid good money for the live detainees. The men of the RFP didn't care what their masters wanted the prisoners for, only that the money was good. Every disappeared Bolshevik trash meant more guns, more weapons, everything for the National Revolution. Petlin's uniform was crisp and proper. He savored the occasion, the moment, the instant where hope of escape died in each prisoner's eyes. Some resisted until their turnover to the Japanese, but most of the rest eventually gave in, empty eyes for human shells. Afraid, cowering their lives in Petlin's hands, it felt good to be in Rodzewski's at, or, be Rodzewski's point man. He was judge and arbiter. They find that all that disobeyed the Russian fa... No, he awoke, drenching in sweat. He had. He had never gone and helped in the kidnappings, only heard rumors, only... <clears throat> Petlin... Sat on his bed. Lydia gone. Brought me to the restroom. Heart beating, memories of Harbin fading and vivid in his mind. He had known the RFP's worst slugs. Petlin had known what they were up to. He had done nothing, mainly out of apathy. He had believed, back then, thought that the VOD could do no wrong. Petlin knew that he shared in the goats. He stood and shook his head. Perhaps he could not atone, yet he had to try. Only a past, only half buried. The Weiss of Magadan. Mikhail Matovsky stood overlooking a large map of Magadan in its hinterland in the conference room that he and his top advisors often met him. He sighed, taking in the reality of his situation. While Magadan was a real town, most of the territory that he controlled was either depopulated, underdeveloped, or both. It wasn't exactly an ideal situation for a government that needed bodies and industry as fast as possible, as a number of ministers filed in, all of them presumably having been briefed on the nature of the meeting. Matkovsky turned to them. In his well-known, tactful manner, he addressed his audience. It's clear that our current <clears throat> industrial situation is untenable. Continuing, Moving aside to show his ministers the map, we need to take action to ensure that we're not overwhelmed by our southern rivals. It's no secret that they enjoy Japan's material support. One minister, Goldsov, spoke up. It'll take some more work, of course, but I've been thinking the same thing. We cannot allow ourselves to be outcompeted by our rivals. A few proposals can be drawn up, my boss. Industrialization, under my direct supervision of the government, attracting any potential foreign investment by enemies necessary. Mikoski looked around the room, waiting for any other comments before continuing. Good. Please do. I don't plan on matching Rodzeski and the Whites, and I want to outstrip their production. Tacit nods from the most from most followed. Metkovsky made his intentions clear. He wanted to turn Magadan into a city of industry. Not an easy task, certainly, for Magadan's earliest purpose was a stop-off for the work camps and mines in the region. But if the Vaz thought it best, it was probably best. And every person in the room, Metkovsky included, knew that if the Vaz wanted it, it would be done. Metkovsky nodded gently before stating, Well then, let's get to work. We have our work cut out for us. Very, very good. And of course, these degenerates have refused tribute. As expected, Yakuti has told us that they reject our offer and are ready for battle. We must be ready our men, prepare for a fight. Our last bloodshed is sometimes unavoidable, and we must prepare for what is to come. If they aren't going to cooperate, it's time we take the loot from Yakutia by force. That sound of gunfire continues to resonate in the Russian. And we're winning immediately. Great. We have three divisions, and they might have one. Well, we know they have at least one, but an American visit. Hmm. A boat has arrived from Kamchanka. Carrying an interesting passenger, an American tourist. People don't usually come to ru visit Russia from the outside, especially Americans, after all. No one likes visiting war-torn wastelands, especially the spread out and frigid Far East. They probably won't even last a week without freezing to death, unless we help them out somehow. We cannot let a naive or native, yeah, naive American die in the wilderness. The least we can do is provide shelter for a few days. Perhaps Minkowski could even meet with him. Being an American, he could probably be useful for reaching the leadership of the U.S. We always have wanted a closer relationship with the Americans, so why not start now? When we have one right here, Minkowski even believes he has connections to the CIA. What fortune! Besides, it would be a good way to show hospitality. The Americans, or American, thought to be impressed when he meets the true Vaz of the Russians. No matter what, it would make a good impression, which will help us stand out besides all the other warlords surrounding us. However, Maybe it could be better and safer idea just to give him a general tour around Magadan. Letting him see the town will show him the true way of life in Russia better than any other meeting with Matkovsky. Besides, the Vaz is a busy man and may not enjoy wasting his time with a potentially worthless American. So, 
Should we give him a tour of our town, or should Mitkovsky invite him to a drink? Give him a tour? We're sending him straight to Mitkovsky and find the best vodka we have. We get 1.47 political power, which is awesome. Awesome, 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 awesome. Oh, we have two loot already. Wait, how do we get... We had one loot from scavenging. How did we get the second loot? I'm not going to question this. Industrial equipment. Entry 2, meeting with Mikovsky. I had a meeting with Magadan's Vaz today, Mikhail Mikovsky. It seemed pretty fun and offered me some um, almost not awful vodka, but overall, the experience was rather strange. He kept asking me about my connections to the president and the CIA. Weirdly enough, maybe it's my hair? After I told him I was just an average American, he seemed a bit disappointed. Then he spoke of how life was in America and what I was doing in Russia. I told him I was a university student back home and I'd come to visit so I could explore Russia and maybe have a little bit of fun and adventure instead of my boring life back home. I don't know what he said after that, but I think it was something about the long lines of how I'll be shot by the first bandit that gets anywhere near me, so oh well. Then I had a few more drinks and proceeded to tell him my dad was an astronaut on a secret mission to Venus as well as back into the war. He had killed 100 Japs with only a pistol. In reality, he's a mechanic and always has been. Mitkowski seemed to enjoy the story, however, although I don't know how much of it he really understood. My Russian isn't the best. After our meeting, he gifted me this enormous bearskin. I guess I should wear it? I already think I'm fine without it as I have my own fur coat, but I accepted it anyways. It's very warm. Next, I'll be heading up to Yakutsk to see what's going on there. At least he had fun, you know? It's good to have fun sometimes. Because if you're not having fun, well, you better be getting paid for it. Cool. And the battle is still going... Well, I mean, it's going... Oh, okay, so this tile is so huge. It looks like it's supposed to be going up here, but not in the name of small change. I don't have anything else, the traitor barked. Surrounded by thugs from the Russian fascist party. Their uniforms brown against the setting sun, visible in the distance beyond the window display windows. They had ransacked his shop, trinkets lay in the ground, and what little cash they had scrounged up and wrung out of the trader's pockets lay on the counter. The shop had seen better days, the days, days the trader could remember with fondness and warmth. The union wasn't perfect, but at least he had, they had not hired overgrown children to boss people around in fascist uniforms. One of the little fascists, just a scrawny man with a fro voice frozen in permanent hysteria, thumped on the counter, sending the few coins on it into tremors. To his face, his fellow thugs called him Vlad, the boss. He, behind him, they ridiculed his hide in his voice and whispered rumors of him knowing some important figures in the political or the party's political wing. I know what you've got some more of, he said. Come on, Bogdan. He, pile, he plied with his hands folded together. For our old friendship, you don't want to have all you ever had destroyed, do you? I am patient, but my friends here are not. I keep begging them, but they won't leave you alone. I beg you, fulfill their simple wishes and pay. Once you pay up, I'll have your back again. Bogdan didn't have anything else. Business had been slow since the fall of the Union, and chaos wasn't exactly great for commerce. He hung on to his shop with a kind of stubborn nostalgia, dreaming that the old towns might return. He turned to his office and to address his tormentors. Wait a moment. Kneeling beneath his desk, he found his family safe and unlocked it again, or a gun, and his late wife's jewelry. His hand inched towards his hand inched towards a pistol, but he stopped mid-motion. Not today, not wise. He took her wedding ring and handed it to Vlad. I am so glad, Vlad said, that you decided to relent. After all, you are one of our favorite customers. Till later, Vlad. Till later. Oh, that's kind of sad, but whatever. Industrial investments? Don't mind if we do. I'll take civilian factories or military factories, either one, but Siberian farms. As a famous Chinese strategist once said, an army marches not on its feet, but on its stomach. The poor town of Magadan has always relied on outside imports during the time of the cursed union and empire to sustain its need for food, deprived of connections to other regions for the motherland. Most of, us, most of its inhabitants have turned to coastal fishing to make do in the meantime. A secret wish spreads in the heart, though. Born out of hunger for Russia to save them. The party and Mitkovsky with it shall heed their call. The officials will gather volunteers and conscripts to work in the fields of Siberia. The Far East is not fertile, but an effort from an honest Russian will be all it takes to create a miracle. We do not need our storehouses to be filled with food overflowing, just enough to survive the, the harsh climate of Siberia and feed our people. When Russia rises again, all of these will be forgotten like ashes in the wind. Very good. 1.28. And it looks like we have a successful raid. If you like to read about this, go right ahead. This happens every time we play the Russian Unifier, so I'm not too worried about it. This spoils the war, though. Fascist, eh? Mikhail Brusilov. Huh. Voronotsov spoils the war. Victory. Our raiding parties have dragged home great bounties tied down to the roofs of military vehicles and lumped them in sacks carried on horseback with, from enemy territories. With these treasures, we are able to fill our coffers, restock our armies, and increase production in local industries. The balance of power has clearly shifted in our favor. With each skirmish to come, we're better armed to tackle these challenges that encroach across the wild Russian frontiers. Help us in the future, stability, war support, and more rifles? Sign me up. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to do one, two, three, because you never know if someone might attack us since we do have a single loot. And that does prompt some other people who might want to come take it from us. Which would not be very, very cool. War planning, political campaigns, not worth it. So, 
Siberian farms, we've got five days left. After that, try something else. With the founding of the Siberian factories and farms, the party in Magadan has established itself as a force capable of action and reform. Unfortunately, these actions have only had limited success so far, as hard as it is for Metkovsky and his political clique to admit it, time will only tell as to the efficacy of these efforts. For now, we can only wait. In the meantime, there's another matter of the armed forces of the party. Though capable and relatively well armed, our men are not suited for or used to fighting in the far north. It's time to try something else. Mikoski has soldiered himself in an age long past. Shall observe as his generals and officers forge from the soldiers a new army of hardened and experienced men capable of fighting in the tumultuous weather of Siberia. Drills will be a regular occurrence, whether in harsh or clear conditions. Every soldier of Magadan shall be the spearhead of Mikoski's crusade. Very good. Masks. Katharina saw her father sit down at the entrance of their house, oblivious to her presence. She found him clutching his temples as if a hair splitting headache I was tearing him apart. It wasn't the first time she noticed that her father tended to linger outside for a bit before she entering before she entered the house. Now, as the sun was setting, its orange light aged his t features among or beyond the man's already formidable years. He had joined the party since its first days in Harbin and was a veteran of the anti-Bolshevik front. People from inside the party, further up in the hierarchy, call her father Vlad the Tall and a mockery of his height. Outside the party, they called him a thug, a criminal, a robber, vested with a RFP uniform. Sometimes he could see his reputation manifest itself when he met his neighbors. Small business owners, shopkeepers, and the fishermen of the port looked back at him with a mix of fear, rep reprehension, and disgust. Anytime any of them dared across the Vlad's path, however, they scurried away almost immediately, and when he drew his gun, a trusty Nambu, he kept by his side for years again since the days of Harbin. In Katarina's eyes, however, she did not find a monster in the figure of her father, standing as a single silhouette against the dying day. He felt his mask lapse and vanish every time he spoke a word to her. The icy, the icy and reserved, aloof, harsh, and cold attitude melted, revealing beneath him, if not a decent man, a husk of one. She ran out of the door and caught her father's hand, surprising him. It's dinner time, she said, a smile across her face and words, get in, an image of a man painted in different shades. Oh, Vlad the Tall, I hope we have more story with you. That's just better, yeah, gateway into Russia, Port of Magadon. Yeah, just in case. Oh, actually, do you have an upgrade to Constantine? Are you the guy we actually wanted here? Huh. Well, let's make sure we actually give him this thing for now. And go back to Pavlov. Great. Well, it gets so much political power, which we will need later on to save. But, let's see. We're going to probably invest in... Ult ah, here we go. We have received an ultimatum from Mikuti up there demanding that we hand over a tribute of loot, or else they would raid it and take it away from us. We are to impasse to decide. Do we engage in... Uh, in confrontation with the Akutia, possibly risking our men dying at the hands of our enemies, or do we instead stand down and cave in to their demands, giving them their desired loot, allowing our men to live to fight another day? We just bought, beat them, and took their own loot, so, no. Okay, so, the problem with this nation is that it, it it's not great because of all the distance. I put one, two, three, I should have spread it out a little bit more this way. So we could actually lose here, which would really, really suck, because of how long it takes for our soldiers to get over there, because I'm never exactly sure where things are going to occur. Trainer troops, that'd be good. I'm going to go ahead and grab more infrastructure, though. If I can. No, we can't. Oh, hold on. What if I lowered this by one? Because I did want to max this out. No? Okay, that might be glitch, then. That is very odd. Okay, are you guys going to move over there quickly enough, or what? Try something else. Preliminary armoring? Let's grab that one. The time has come for Siberian factories to be built to bear fruit. With enough workers to staff the floors and sufficient machinery, they can begin to operate as intended. From the streets of Magadan, these factories' chimneys can be seen churning out smoke, a hint of things that they create with them. Rifles, uniforms, bullets, and even artillery guns and shells lurk inside of them. The parties triumph again in the most desperate of situations, and Mikoski is pleased. It's time to arm the militant wing of the party. With adequate equipment, our soldiers will stand to fight the Reds, Tsars, or Redzevsky with much greater strength, even if it is a mistake to underestimate them so early. This advantage will afford us opportunity we need to unify the Far East as Mikoski gears up for a crusade to liberate the motherland from the clutches of suffering and disunity. Yeah, we're gonna be able to, we're gonna lose this battle here. Inspection day. Mikhail Mikoski, the Vaz himself, made his way down to the Mag Magadan garrison to inspect the quality of the troops that made up his army. The chilly morning air seemed not to have any effect on the Vaz, who was in full military dress as he and his high command approached the troops in formation. All the soldiers were dressed as he and was sported their weapons of war, but even before he approached them, Matkowski could tell what poor soldiers they would make. His journalists exchanged nervous glances with one another. One soldier was too fat, the other malnourished. The third was too short, and the fourth didn't even have his uniform's buns done upright. They all had the full uniform, but it seemed as if they had simply borrowed bits and pieces from the peers. A lot of them didn't even fit. 
All of them, though. Not just these four were equipped with weapons that looked like they'd been outdated by the times the Germans were ravaging the west of Russia. This sorry state of affairs made it blatantly obvious to Matkovsky that on one hand, uh, of one of the most important days of their lives, these troops could barely muster together even the smallest shred of professionalism. The inspection ended at Matkovsky politely walking along the columns of the Magadan garrison, taking mental notes. Scruffy beards, outdated weapons, ill-discipline. Matkovsky knew that it wasn't their fault for the most part. He had a chronic shortage of bodies, weapons, and officers, all of who were necessary for raising and maintaining a professional army. After the inspection, he had called a meeting of his high command where a rare flare of anger shown through his usual professional behavior. What is going on? These are the best troops that you have to offer me? He asked his generals. A number of cursory excuses were offered, but Matkovsky put his hand up to demand their silence. I don't want to hear it. These are the men who guard the capital. What do... What do those in the front lines look like? How do you think we will overcome Radzewski, let alone retake the entirety of Russia? I don't care what the solution is. I want you to find it, and I want it to be briefed on this on this time tomorrow. Oh, come on. It's not that bad. They're just completely overweight, I guess, and some of them are just completely malnourished, rising, rising tension zone. It all started with a game of cards in a bar. Alexei's joint, just down the street from the port of Magadan. There are a couple of locals, their names blurring on the party line sheet, were playing blackjack. The gamble was over, a couple of drinks and several hundred rubles, nothing big, but nothing small. They expected the night to go on as smoothly as it always did, a cruise into the moonlight as the games continued, pockets emptying and men filling into the streets with the grace of drunken feet. Three listless men entered the bar. New rivals of Magadan. They were wearables men. Heavily armed and heartily paid. Professional soldiers that hailed from all corners of the world. They had too much free time at first day, and the locals got along quite nicely, which is to say they did not interact much at all. Only silent nods and scarce eye contact bridged the difference between the group. The uneasy truce did not last long, however. The listless men flirted with the girls behind the counter, and the locals did not like it. Standing up, they shouted profanities at the mercenaries in a language they did not understand. It didn't take long for the soldiers to unholster their pistols and threaten the locals. It only took a minute before one of the mercenaries accidentally fired a shot, resulting in a dead civilian who was only found hours later after the rioting had ensued. The locals, instead of being driven back by the gunshots, charged our men, using broken bottles and chairs to attack the new arrivals. Horrible mercenaries, dispatched as a backup for the new arrivals, got involved shortly. The party's police, who intervened to stop more bloodshed, were met with a rain of bullets and jagged glass. After a dozen dead civilians and two dozen more wounded. The riots were finally put down by force. The three mercenaries were immediately tried and sentenced. The party's police, for the part, did their jobs after two hours. A premonition, maybe? Oh, come on. You can get there. Come on. Come on. Use those chubby or malnourished legs. Gosh dang it, we lost it. Dang it. Our reports have come back from the frontiers, and it's terrible news. Bandits have ambushed our garrisons and massacred our men, leaving them as grotesque and gnarled corpses scattered across the plains. Moreover, we've been informed that they have infiltrated border towns and villages, plundering and looting all they could from the defenseless population. Where the units unprepared, there is little more we can do as they scurry back to where the men came, uh, having left a path of utter misery and ravage behind them. That's complete BS. I mean, seriously. One, two, three, four, five. Why? Why does it have to be like this? So far away. God, it's so bad. Level... No, I... Level 4, at level 4 infrastructure, they should be able to move a little bit faster if you'd like to do about this, go right ahead. Good God, that sucks. Holy crap. That is so bad. That is so dumb. So bad. So dumb. Ugh. I'm coming for you again. That is so stupid that coming over here takes, like, literally two months or something like that. Not literally two months, but it's so dumb. Why does it take so long? I'm putting these guys over here because you never know if Alden might attack us. Oh, let me go back to where I've got to do this. Not successful raid. Well, we don't have a successful successful raid. We were raided, so. Uh, no, still nothing there. Well, if that's the case, I might get more trainer troops or just save up political power. So, winterized gear. Let's go ahead and grab acquired visors. The lands of Siberia have a long history. From even before the time of the Empire's rapid expansion eastward in past centuries, various people have dwindled here or dwelled here, enduring the harsh weather and making a living from it. The troops of Magadan have much to learn from them, and their advice on surviving in the wild could mean the difference between life and death in the unrelenting conditions of the Far East. To acquire these advisors, some troops, along with local interpreters, will travel north to the land surrounding Kamchatka. There will be a we, there we will establish contacts with the natives in hopes of using their millennia of experience to aid in the development of our own theory of warfare. We shall mold our soldiers and the survivors into victors. No longer shall they survive in the Siberian wilds by the skin of their teeth. From now on they shall live with neither doubt nor concern given to gods of the far eastern lands. A triple, a double, 33% bonus to land doctrine. Not bad. I'm ready to go again. Come on, come on. Let me go, let me go, let me go. I'm ready to raid them. I'm going to teach these people a lesson. A second lesson. Yeah, this is really weird. This, this must be bugged, because usually you get one infrastructure. We only, As we saw, we only level, like, four political campaign. Not worth it. There we go. Okay, you're going to bow down to me, or are you going to not like me anymore? Oh, wait, they might have two divisions? Did they change that? Lonely lights, eh? On its surface, Dmitry, uh, Sergei Dmitrievich, Dmitri Solyoyev, was not a dangerous man to the RFB. His printing press followed all the party's guidelines and regulations, and he lent them his business from time to time to print propaganda. However, on nights like these, with the moon nowhere in sight and accompanied by a single oil lamp, he let his facade drop, he unscrewed his flask, and drank some terrible vodka he'd saved from the local distillery. 
wretched stuff. But there's nothing better. The party took the cream of the crop for themselves. He returned to his desk, his figure throwing shadows in all directions. Sergei was in his office, in his element. He considered lighting up a cigarette where he worked, while he worked, but he decided against it. Sitting down, he glanced at the pamphlets he had written, satisfied at his work. Soon, the garbage collection detail would come and collect his pieces, distributing them along among the streets of Magadan. He paid them a small sum to keep quiet about it. Leaning down, Sergei almost dozed off before a thought knocked him on his skull. Why did he do this? Resistance to the party was minuscule, and his men were not more loyal to his money than anything else he could offer. He looked at his oil lamp, its fuel running low, a single candlelit, candlelight holding out against a black drop of darkness. The symbolism was not lost on Sergei. Perhaps in a few days, in a few weeks, maybe even a year, he would find himself in a basement, moments away from being snuffed out. Or snuffed out. He put aside his worries. A knock sounded, and Sergei stood and answered it. Embers of a past age. Or a lost age. Either one. Ooh, we get more manpower. You know what? Let, let's see if they. Let's do this first. And if they say no, I'm going to do trainer troops. Come on, refuse the tribute. Good. I'm going to do this one. This way we get 5% more army XP gain. It's not much, but it's a thousand more manpower. We'll take it. I'll take it. Okay. See, look at this. What the heck? I put these guys. Because there's a raid. We're getting raided over here. Now it's in the center? Doesn't make sense, man. Doesn't make sense. Not very bueno. Not very bueno. But whatever. Actually, how's the research coming along? The Croatian Bottom. Very cool. A couple more days left, and then we should do radical techniques. Yes. The Far East is a wild, wild land, sparsely inhabited even during the Union and Empire. Without the civilization to sustain the Russian expansion east, life has become challenging and unrelenting. In the forests and tundras of Siberia, war does not assume the character it has further west. With no significant infrastructure to speak of, warfare in the north is to reduce the skirmishes between the little powers that battle for control of the Far East. To come out on top of Siberia would mean abandoning the general precepts of war as it is taught in Europe. For the sake of our cause, all we must leave behind everything, we must leave behind everything we know. After all, the methods of war change to fit the ages. Our soldiers will receive a radical new training regimen based on the lessons or we have learned from the Siberian natives. Soon the forests and tundras of Siberia will be like the plains and fields of Western Russia to us, with no obstacle to stop us from attacking the enemy, whether it be Rodzevsky, the Tsars, or even the Reds. Civil rights of 62. Oh, look at that. Wow. Yeah, this is what you get. Uh, the Saka Republic. Man, we need more divisions. Whew. Who's currently leading? Yuri Vitivsky. Um. Trading faces. Hey, it's you! Tom turned to meet the uh, eager Russian uh, whose slurred speech and broken English could most likely be attributed to the bottle. My bad. He clutched. The frankness of the drunkard reminded him of back home. It was an amusing end to a long day. You've got it all wrong, pal, he started to say. Oh, don't make merry with me, American. You're John, his brow furrowed, unable to conjure a full name. The famous hero in the cowboy hat. Come with me. And arms linked around Tom's shoulder. And the pair began walking towards the city center. Tom thought for a moment, glancing over his shoulder, back towards his crew in the sad, cold dockyard they inhabited. For a split second, he prepared to shake the man off, but then his posture relaxed and his resistance stopped. Why not be John Wayne for a while? The two men eventually reached a bar, and Thomas Tremblay's newfound comrade, Alexander, kicked open the door violently. Brothers, look at the American who has decided to come smuggling in our port. The one from the movies. Blank faces stared back at the unfolding spectacle, seemingly annoyed at the disruption. Tom grinned, mustering a hand-fisted southern drawl. Well, howdy, folks. The room erupted into jovial cheers and laughs. Or laughter. Many, having been drunken into a stupor themselves, indulge but the fantasy. Others simply indulge in a good time. Tom was one such man, playing his part and chatting between beers for much of the night. Today had been a good day after all. A warm night and a cold, cold place. Seize all we can use. Oh, um, that's, I'm going to come back for them. Actually, the next one we should do is agricultural methods, because that's actually really, really good to do behind uh, what we already have. So, one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to do the exact same thing again. You guys come up here, and you come to the center. If you want to read about this, go right ahead, and we're going to get some of our stuff back. Nope. Nope. No infrastructure, even though it says invest in infrastructure. Yeah, there's no point. Just kind of save our stuff up for now, and winterize gear. Among all the ways that the Far East can be inhospitable, the most prominent house is its low temperature. To move in the cold Siberian winter is hard. To find it is even harder. Worse, the gear that our soldiers currently use often decays or is otherwise useless in the harsh weather. We must find a solution that has the winter conditions are a near constant concern for the troops. Moreover, acquiring a durable equipment for the Siberian winter could give our soldiers another crucial advantage against our enemies. Mikoski will order all military equipment to be winterized. As most of our equipment is not ready to be used in low temperatures, this will be a lengthy and involved process. However, this is a struggle we must endure. The eventual liberation of Russia will take everything we have, and this small inconvenience is nothing compared to that challenge. Someday, when Mikoski rules Russia, all of this will prove its worth. So division attrition goes down, winter, winter attrition goes down by 50%, and cold acclimatization gain factor plus 50%. That's not too bad. Not too bad. And what do you have over here? Reunification of Russia, form the Siberian National Republic. Sounds like fun. 
Brazil wins the World Cup. Do they always win the World Cup? It seems like they do. Put you back under Pavlov. Unless you're Pavlov himself. No, you're Yuri. Alexander. We got quite a bit of political power here. I like it. I like it a lot. We got only get 2.3 million in GDP. Not a lot. Really not quite a bit. We got about a week left for that. And behind the screens, the crowd was rejoicing in rare side in Russia. Their cinemas didn't even have levels for the seats, and the people had below had to compete and shove others out of the way for a glimpse of the silver screen. Thomas sat in the projection booth nursing a bottle of vodka personally given by the boss who was sitting at the front. He took a sip, expecting the bitter flavor to overwhelm him. Instead, it felt light. Tasting of dirt. Horrible. He put it down, settling it behind his ankles. Thomas stared at the image, a blurry mess of green blobs charging black dots on the screen. Today's movie was an adaptation of a famous American comic book, Captain America. For Thomas, a connoisseur of supreme of the movie industry, this film was trash. Its projection and audio were even worse than the script. It found out too late that the lenses didn't fit and he had to prop it in with some tape. The result was a screen infested with a permanent blur and the crackling scarce and incomplete audio made the viewing experience into something fantastical. Mikhail Matkovsky, the vase of the Russians, he, as he sat himself, sat at the front, a charismatic, almost intimidating man. It was almost comical to see him laughing at what Americans would think was garbage. Intelligence, it seems, did not uplift taste. The hero charged at the enemy, and the brown blobs collapsed and turned backwards. The crowd cheered, and their error was that of dis discordant revelry. Thomas leaned down to pick up his bottle of vodka, only to send it tumbling and sp spilling it all over the floor. He sighed. It's going to be a long, long night. And the collapse of the invert. Great. Taking out the winter. We've done all that we can. The factories and farms stand. They produce the produce finding their way to the soldiers and citizens alike. Native advisors have trained their men into hardened soldiers capable of surviving the inhospitable far eastern climate while maintaining combat effectiveness. The winterization order is complete. The equipment churned out by our many factories are now capable of performing in low temperatures. We are ready to act, but winter's coming. There's not much we can do against the forces of nature. We must set the winter out and st station the soldiers to perform maintenance on the telegram poles and roads. Patrols will still happen to ensure that Mikowski's domain will remain free of crime and banditry, but no combat exercises will take place. All units will operate as usual, adjusting for weather. When it ends, there's an enormous task that awaits us all, and Mikowski shall stand ready at the helm. We get 5% more war support and 25 more political power. Don't mind if we do. All right, now it's time to get more industrial investments. Love it. Love it. Love it. And we're going to secure more control because I love stability. Stability is key to me. Or for me. Italian Empire declared war on the Republic of Yugoslavia. What's a Yugoslavia? It's going to be Italy someday, but... Oh, look. Tito. The last Yugoslav. He's not very good for stability or political power, but that's okay. Nice. So got that. We're gonna. So what we're gonna do is get this research done first, and then I'm gonna go with land auction, and then we're gonna go for helicopters. So sitting out the winter, followed by desperate times. After all that we've done has come to this. Our food supplies are running out. Our winterized equipment barely works in the winter winds, and our farms and factories are non-functional. The winter might have come and gone, but it has left its mark on our efforts to stabilize the realm and gain traction amid the harsh Siberian conditions. Perhaps it is time to look outward, using Matovsky's plans to reach out to foreign powers and emigrants to support his cause in Russia. We have three options that we can go through. The Tsar, adding a cheetah, is our unwilling enemy at best. Perhaps he can, we can convince his clique to accept a ceasefire. The Americans, under, the, under President Nixon, may be inclined to support us, provided we make them promises of reform. Finally, the Russian emigres, the most prominent of whom is the influential fascist Anatse Vonsiatsky, might be persuaded to, through their resources, throw the resources behind our cause, regardless of whom we convince to support us. One thing is clear, the party will not survive alone. Magadan Free Radio Broadcast Uno. The broadcast started wrong. Before the talk show began, the Magadan Free Radio played a sequence of songs plagued by crackling audio. The inexperienced crews of the MFR, fascists unused to any other work than thuggery, had mixed the sound with too much bass and unmistakably placed a treble dial. The audio cuts a thump. Two thumps. Is this thing on? A chorus voice said, his lips smacking too close against the microphone. Oh, it is! Another voice, a smooth baritone, said from a far corner of the room, We're, he we're live. What the heck are you saying? Trembling on the table as the voice closed in, three taps on the table, follow the script, an awkward pause. Did you forget to disconnect the microphone? Did you? <sighs> this is such a disaster. And an electric discharge sound as, as the mic was unplugged. The badly mastered songs continued, rattling the first broadcast of the MFR. The audio cuts out again. The chorus voice is returned and still a little too close to the mic. Hello, fellow Russians in the Far East. Welcome to the, my ver the very first broadcast of the Magadan Free Radio. Lip smacking. My name is Sergey. I'm host of the radio tonight, alongside my friend Vasi. Sergey's voice trailed off. A few moments later, he shouted into the mic, likely blowing out a few eardrums. Vasily. Vasily took a seat audibly. With a little sigh, he began, "Yes, with my friend Sergey here, we shall accompany you through many, many cold Siberian nights in the future." An affected cheer for now. We'd like to thank Mr. Metkovsky, the boss of the RFP, for sponsoring this program. An awkward silence as the clocks ticked into the background. Just for now, though, let's proceed with the music. Just before the audio turned on again, the smooth baritone voice said. What the heck is wrong with you? 
What a way to make a first impression. I, oh, I was about to say, I love fascism because that was said it was going to give us stuff, but uh, let's hold off on some things. We're, we're going to scan through, let's get through one more focus before we end this episode. Ooh, look at that, we got five army XP. Actually, are we making, we're not making any divisions. What is wrong with me? Don't answer that, please. Actually, you know what, let's make one, see if we can. Because I think we do get some divisions later on, too, so. People's Revolutionary Council, Tito and the Partisans defeated. What happens if Tito actually wins? That's a good question to ask. We got four days left. Cool. This for time. We're gonna go with the Vaz, the Presidente, the Tsar dude. Smuggling routes. Well, I like that. More political power stability. For two years. Welcoming wearable. Is there anything here for like increasing social developments and stuff? Societal development? Doesn't look like it. I'm gonna go ahead and go with this one with American stuff first, just because we get extra political power, stability, and extra political power. So the president, to, our, to find our greatest possible supporter, we must look across the vast Pacific Ocean and set our eyes on the superpower of the Western Hemisphere, the U.S. of A. They are one of the three most powerful nations in the world and possess almost unparalleled industrial and military might. Nikoski has set his eyes on getting past at least a few or a small fraction of what might support his quest to reclaim Russia. President Nixon is the nation's current leader, and so far he has not shown much willingness to involve American and Russian affairs, something we need to change. There are two requirements to gain American support. The first is to provide a regime can be useful and reliable asset. The second is to show that we are different from the fascists they hate. Achieving both will be crucial if we want, to over want overseas aid to arrive. Actually, you know what? I lied. I'm going to do one more focus after this. One more. Just one more. Oh, look at this. Raid against... I'm going to beat you. I'm going to beat you up, man. Improve American relations? I think we probably have to do that. I mean, this stuff is nice and all, but... We want to get American relations so we can buy guns, trucks, artillery. That'd be kind of nice. Rare raid? We'll be ready. I hope. 1.49. This is why I want to max out political power as fast as possible. And then maybe we'll do some verbal stuff, maybe. We'll see what happens. And let's go. Give up, you son of a gun. We've got you surrounded. That's what I thought. The president. Cool. Siberian Bill of Rights, a big obstacle preventing us from receiving our support across the Pacific, is our ideology, as the American government is under the impression that we are an oppressive and totalitarian regime like the ones they are struggling to fight against. To portray ourselves in a positive light, perhaps it's time to begin making reforms, or at least appear to be making them, and a good start is guarantee on the rights of our citizens. A formal document will be drafted and signed by Mikhail Makhovsky, guaranteeing basic rights such as equal treatment, freedom of expression, and freedom of assembly to all people, ethnic Russians or not. Regardless of whether we follow law to the letter, it will be a sign that we are eager for reforms, and we are not the same as the German Nazi, something the American definitely cares about and the man in the White House. Nikolai Petlin adjusted his tie. A mental tick, something he learned a long time ago in the RFP. Looking over his desk, he ruminated on the task Mitkovsky had assigned to him. A typewriter surrounded by rolls and rolls of ink. Practically a luxury, Petlin could not imagine uh, writing those letters in appeals by hand. He spent long hours in his office and his fingers twitched as he prepared himself to type again. His assistants could only do so much. None spoke English and to ask Mitkovsky for aid would overstep pro propriety. He sighed. He remembered the words Mikoski told him. Convince the man in the White House, his master had said, staring into Petlin's eyes without flinching. That is all. Mikoski did not like being taken lightly. At the best of times, Petlin could see the old Harbin spirit in him, a spirit of hope, of kindling, of a prayer for a new home. The winter had extracted its toil upon the man, and the gaunt, flushing cheeks were but symptoms of the payment. He looked beneath his desk. Stacks upon stacks of paper, numbering almost in the thousands. Soon, upon the completion of his task, these would be sent to America. Finding themselves in the mailboxes of the senators, representatives, Russian emigres, and other assorted people who were receptive to Metkovsky's project, on top of the furthest stack lay a folder, bound in a manila yellow. Plastered to the front of it, labeled that red Siberian Bill of Rights. The document contained Petlin's personal ideas to solicit more aid or at least sympathy from the Americans. He wondered if Mikoski knew what his real sympathies were. He shook his head. And now was not the time for the mind to wander. He laid his fingers upon the keys of the typewriter and the clacking began. Let's hope this works. Awesome. But hope you enjoyed our first episode playing as Magadan, my friends. If you did, consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I hope I will see you tomorrow in the next episode when we might... <clears throat> Have a little bit of fun with a couple mercs. Thanks for watching and have a great rest of your day.